Hi, my name is Randy Agert, and this is a brief introduction to pragmatics. Segmented discourse representation theory, motivation from chronology. In a previous video, I introduced you to discourse representation theory. In this video, I'm going to look at segmented discourse representation theory. This is a more elaborated theory that's sort of based on the foundations of discourse representation theory. This is a theory that was developed by Nicholas Asher. I'm going to offer just a sort of simplified motivation for why we might want to add some complexity to traditional discourse representation theory. I'm going to begin just by giving some examples and thinking about them kind of intuitively. We'll start with the sentence, Max fell. Right? Imagine this is the beginning of a discourse. At this point, we've just described an event. But now imagine that the next utterance is, John helped him up. Now, intuitively, we understand that these things happened chronologically. Max fell, John helped him up. In other words, John helped Max to stand up again. All right, so in this case, John is being a nice guy, helping Max up after falling. On the other hand, if we start with that same sentence, Max fell, but now we follow it up with John pushed him. Well, that changes our understanding of the events, right? In the previous one, the idea was that this happened in chronological order. Now we have to understand these events as happening in counter chronological order. That is to say that Max fell because John pushed him, right? This is a cause and effect relationship. Whereas in the previous one, it was a narration. Right? We were just telling, saying one event happened and then another event happened. Now we're explaining why Max fell. And the reason is because John pushed him. All right, in this one, John is not such a nice guy. All right, now let's assume that we actually begin with a different sentence. So the discourse actually begins with the utterance, John kicked Max. Then we get our familiar Max fell. Now, again, we've got a cause and effect situation, except for this time the cause came first and then the effect. So John kicked Max, making Max fall. All right, now if we follow that up with John pushed him, now first of all, John seems to be a real jerk, right? John kicks Max, makes him fall over, and then he pushes him when he's down, right? Okay, <laughs> that aside, our understanding of this changes, right? So before, when we started with Max fell and followed it up with John pushed him, our understanding was that John pushing Max was the cause of Max falling. But in this case, we've already got a cause. We've already got the cause of the fall is that John kicked him. And so it sort of blocks it just intuitively, pre-theoretically, we think that you know that that fact that we already understand what the cause is blocks us from understanding John pushed him as being our cause. Okay, now the point of all of this is that traditional discourse representation theory is not going to be able, able to account for the different interpretations we get depending on what has come before or comes after, the way that we interpret this, the chronology of events. So now let's look at how we actually are going to encode this into a discourse representation structure. So we'll begin with Max Fell, and we've got our typical discourse representation structure. Um, compared to the previous video that I did, this one's a little more complicated in that I've added representation for time. I wasn't bothering with tense in the previous video, but this time we're going to deal with tense as well as uh, these entities. So we've got our entity x1, which we associate with max, and then we've got our tense t1, which we're going to say happened before now. That is to say it's 
past tense. So this little less than symbol means that this T1 happened before the present. And then we've got our proposition that X1 fell at time T1. Now we're going to have our same discourse representation structure with our more complex discourse where now we say Max fell and then John helped him up. All right, now the next one, we begin with our preliminary discourse representation structure. Now we've got two individuals. We've got X2 and X3, X2 associated with John. X3 being a pronoun should be linked to something. And that's why we say it's preliminary is that at this point, we don't have anything to link it to. That's gotta be an inference. So that pronoun being linked to something else is gonna be an inference. And I put it in red to, to highlight that fact. Again, we've got T2 being before now, and we say helped up X2, X3 at time T2. Now, we're going to merge these two but to understand how we're going to merge them, we first need to understand what's the relationship between them, that this is a narration relationship. First, Max fell, then John helped him up. Okay, so now that understanding, that's what's crucial to segmented discourse representation theory, is that we're going to encode that rhetorical connection between the two Discourse, discourse representations, as well as the pronouns and the tense and all of that. All right, so what that leads us to is this discourse representation structure over here. And notice that now we've got a little more complexity to it. We've got pi one and pi two. These represent the two utterances. So pi one represents Max fell, and pi two represents John helped him up and we're associating these two through narration. So these two are connected rhetorically through this rhetorical connection, narration. And that then is going to give us a bit over here. That's going to tell us that, or, or entail that T2 happens after T1. That's what the narration rhetorical connection tells us. We also now make this inference here that we didn't have before, which connects X3 to X1 here. Now, one thing that we would need to iron out in a, in a more fleshed out version of this is accessibility. Clearly this uh, discourse representation structure has to be accessible, has to be able to access, I should say, this one here. So in other words, this X3 equals x1 has to be able to access that x1 up here. Um, I'm going to leave that to you to explore how those um, accessibility rules are fleshed out in, in a more fleshed out version of the theory. All right, so that's our first one. Now we're going to look at our other discourse, similar, Max fell, John pushed him. We begin again with Max fell same thing as we had before. And this next one is going to look very similar, except for now we've got a different predicate here is pushed. So this is John pushed him, that is John pushed Max, which we're going to derive through an inference that X3 is connected to Max up there. But what's important to us, again, is our rhetorical connection. And remember, what we said is that this is not narration now. This is cause and effect. And I use the little arrow to indicate that this is causing this. And now we merge them. And again, we're going to get these two utterances, pi one and pi two. But now they're connected not through narration, but through cause. In other words, pi two causes pi one. And because of that, we're going to get this, that time two precedes time one, doesn't follow, right? So in the previous one where it was John helped him up, we understood because of narration that T2 
follows T1. Now it precedes T1. And again, we've got X3, that is that pronoun him, being associated with Max, with X1 here. Okay, now we're going to look at our final chronology of events, our final discourse, John kicked Max. Max fell. Again, we assume a cause and effect pattern there. And then we get John pushed him. And now, unlike the previous example, the previous discourse, where we assumed that this event of pushing happened prior to Max falling, that is through a cause and effect, again, that's blocked because of the causes already here. And I'll talk just a little bit about that, how that actually falls out from the theory of segmented discourse representation. Um, okay, but so these two are connected through cause, This, these two through narration. All right, now we're going to have this as our first discourse representation for John kicked Max. That should look fairly familiar to you now. And then we've got our second one, Max fell. Now, one thing I want you to notice is we assume that these two Maxes are the same, but that's through an inference, which we'll see in a second. So we've got our rhetorical connection of cause, this caused this, and then we merge them, getting our structure over here, where we have our utterance one, utterance two, pi one, pi two, and now they're connected through cause. Notice that when we were looking at Max fell, John pushed him, we assumed that pi two, ca pi two caused pi one, but then in this case, it's actually happening in chronological order. We got the cause first and then the effect, and so it's pi one, pi two, instead of pi two, pi one, and Again, as I said, we've got this inference that it's the same max. That's a fairly simple inference that we're ta not talking about a different max there, but it's still an inference of sorts. There's still that possibility that we're talking about two different maxes. So we do want to include that as an inference. And notice again that this falls out from our rhetorical connection of causality. And so since T2 is our um, effect, T1 has to precede T2. Okay, now we're going to take this discourse representation structure, and that's now going to be the context for our next discourse representation structures, for our next utterance. So in other words, we now have John kicked Max, Max fell represented here, and now we add John pushed him, which we're going to represent here, and that takes as its context this here. So again, remember that the theory of discourse representation structures is that each, each discourse representation structure is a context for the next utterance in the discourse. Now, we've got our rhetorical connection between them is narration, as we've said before, and we're going to merge them giving now this structure here, where we've got pi 3 is our um, discourse representation structure here. So this is the context that feeds pi 4. And now we've got this idea that narration, so pi 3 feeds pi 4 through the connection of narration. And again, because of that, then T3 has to follow T2, and we get these linkings between X5 and X3. So again, there's going to be this accessibility issue where we need to be able to access X3 here to know that him in John pushed him refers to Max. And of course, that John is the same John that we met up here, the jerk who, push, who kicks somebody, knocks them down, and then pushes them when they're down. Now, there's a lot more to the theory, and it deals, it can explain a lot more data, but I thought this was a fairly contained set of data that could explain why we want this approach, where a standard discourse representation structure approach really can't explain why we get a difference from Max fell, John helped him up in terms of the ordering, versus Max fell, 
John pushed him. Whereas with this theory, it actually falls out pretty nicely that those are going to be the logical assumptions as we go. Now, we still need to make certain inferences as we go, like, for example, this inference of what causes what, what is narration, but some of it is going to be systematized in terms of what is a possible um, connection and what's going to be not a possible connection. So in sum, I just want to say, I think that this uh, elaborated version of discourse representation theory has a lot of promise, and I think it can explain a lot of facts of language and facts of conversation that cannot be explained with the standard discourse representation theory.